Accessing library computer data. And to make sure history never forgets the name Enterprise. Hey, everybody, welcome back to the Penske Podcast. If you haven't tuned in before, this is a podcast where we are running through all 178 episodes of Star Trek The Next Generation, giving our thoughts and feelings about each and every one. Right now we're up to episode 19 of season 2. This one is called Manhunt. Uh, in this episode, the Enterprise must transport delegates to a conference, one of whom is an extremely man-hungry Loxana, Loxana, let's try that again, Loxana Troy, with eyes for Picard. This one aired back on June 19th, 1989. It was directed by Rob Bowman and written by Terry Devereaux, which is a pen name for Tracy Tormey. Um, This one, Clay and Sean are here to join me to talk about this one. So right after this break, we're going to get into Manhunt. Starship Enterprise, come in. We have you on viewer pilot. Enterprise, I have a passenger, a VIP passenger who I'm ordered Oh, let me talk to them. I'm sure I'm more articulate than that. Mother... Captain, we are receiving Starfleet orders granting a Luaxana... Luaxana Troy, a daughter of the fifth house, holder of the sacred chalice of Reeks, heir to the holy rings of Beta Z. Full ambassadorial status, sir. It looks like it's back in that dress uniform, sir. And yours as well, Commander. She is listed as representing the Beta Z government at the conference. Mother, please don't do this to me. Do what to you, little one? Oh, shot <laughs> Luke. What naughty thoughts. But how wonderful you still think of me like that. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. Hope you enjoyed that audio clip. Uh, so let's get talking about Manhunt. We're going to be talking about Manhunt, the Star Trek The Next Generation episode. Not the controversial video game from probably 2004 or whatever came out then. Wait, this- is this not... Manhunter, the Michael Mann movie? No, no. Uh. <laughs> this is going to be a very confused podcast. And if you heard that voice, you know that I have gone out because I needed some men of my own to talk about this episode. So joining me right now are my associates, Clay Nails McCormick. Clay, how are you? I'm doing pretty well. Uh, yeah, that's all I got right now. That's fine. And then on the other line, we have Sean Carlos Murphy from South America. Sean, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. Thanks, man. Did you did you dress up? You told we, you told us you needed five minutes before we could start doing this. So I hope you put on a, a nice I, suit. I had to put on my white makeup so I convincingly pass as a South American. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about manhunt, manhunt, which might be the greatest disparity between a cool name and what actually happens in the episode. <laughs> um, I'm gonna tell you guys right now. Uh, I don't know how much I'm going to have to add to this because my page of notes is five notes and then a bunch of bad drawings of Riker. <laughs> <laughs> Riker Riker loves this episode. It's a um All right, so I'm just going to give my quick rundown of what happens here. Uh, the, the Enterprise beams aboard some alien species that look like fish and they're comatose and they're trying to bring them to this planet to do something. They also run into uh, Loxana Troy, Deanna's mother, who makes her a return to the show after appearing in the first season. And she's entering some sort of alien menopause where she is off the charts sexually uh, looking to find a husband. And she sets her sights on Picard, who hides out in the holodeck for the second half of the episode. And then uh, everyone just goes their separate ways. And that's pretty much it. That is the entire rundown of what happens here. This episode should be called Star Trek DTF. Yes. <laughs> It'd be a good spinoff. Uh, well, what the hell? How did I want to start this? I did have a... I think I had a track I wanted to go on. Oh, that's it. Um, if you... Besides the fact that this episode features uh, Mick Fleetwood, the drummer from Fleetwood Mac... Where was he? he Who did is, he play? He's the alien. He's one of. He's the front alien. The front alien? Yeah, the fish the, the fish alien that's in the front of the transporter. <laughs> wait, wait, hold on a second. One of those fish aliens <laughs> is, was Mick Fleetwood? Is Hall, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame Mick Fleetwood, yes. <laughs> <laughs> he's going to fire his yeah. acting agent, man. <laughs> he he should I mean, go his own way. He's a huge tre- Trek fan, and he lobbied to be on the show, so they're like, fine. They caved in, and they gave him a mask where you couldn't even recognize him. I think that they must not be Fleetwood Mac fans on the Enterprise. <laughs> no. Yeah, that, yeah, that must just be a very 
It's almost like uh, when South Park was new and George Clooney wanted to be on the show, and so they made him a dog. Oh, yeah. You know, it's it's kind of that sort of like... <laughs> South Park was doing it intentionally. I don't. Star Trek producers might not have been hip enough to know what Fleetwood Mac was. Um, what I wanted to say was, I guess I wanted to start this one off by... Uh, this is Tracy Torme's final script. He wrote it under a pen name of Terry Devereaux or something like that. Uh, Ooh, that's a saucy name. Tracy... <laughs> Tracy Torme wrote The Royale, he wrote The Big Goodbye, and he wrote uh-huh. Haven from the first season. Um, well, he kind of wraps all of those things up into this one episode. He does. Of. And what I was thinking, I watched this one a couple times, I was thinking he left on bad terms. He was upset after The Royale with what uh, Maurice Hurley did to his script. So he reduced his role. He's only called a creative consultant in this one instead of story editor. And he put a pen name on it. And I feel like this episode is, in some ways, is kind of a big middle finger to <laughs> Star Trek. Um, and I don't know if that was intentional or he was just super lazy and was like, fuck it, I wrote about these things in two, uh, two scripts ago. I'll just do it over and pass that in and get paid and get the hell out of here. What would you guys think of the episode in general? Well, I, uh, I, think, I think we need to have some words either off off mic or on mic about these episodes you're having me watch. Uh, because I've yet to, I've yet to be present for one that was really good. <laughs> we, we had, uh, I think matter of honor might've been one of the better ones. Oh yeah, that's true. Okay. One. Yep. Uh, <laughs> I, which is probably the ratio probably that you have watched good ones as well. Having watched all of them. Well, uh, <laughs> maybe if people are, if people are listening to this sort of live as they put them up, I took a week off and a lot of it had to do with, I was just, I, I was running out of enthusiasm for these, the second half of the second season, uh, mm. which is becoming quickly quite bad. Um, anyway, Sean, Sean, what'd you think? Any rough thoughts? Uh, yeah, I know I'm the only, uh, Luxana Troy fan in the universe. Yes. Uh, and I would love love to defend her and i think the problem with this isn't her I, I i gotta say i mean obviously the episode was not great um i think that her story happens to be the eighth story and it's the only thing that really pushes the story forward yep um but yeah it's i i would love to have a better episode to defend her to you guys but this <laughs> is a tough uh it's a tough sell you said any episode this is it it's a um <laughs> it's <laughs> It's weird because, Clay, it's kind of the thing we talk about there, uh, but it's a little bit of an improved version of stuff happens on the way to something. Uh, yeah. This one's interesting in the fact that the, the the stuff that they're on their way to doesn't matter whatsoever. Yeah, it's a it's a stuff happens on the way to something, but the stuff that they're on their way to is is not any more interesting than the stuff that actually happens. Right, and I, like I have no idea what this conference is they're going to. Yeah. Um, this is jumping way ahead, but this has the most bizarre resolution to yes. any episode that I could possibly think of. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that, like, I, you know, I was watching this episode, and I I didn't hate it, but by the end of it, I just, like I said about my, my page of notes, I just, I just couldn't find a lot of stuff to say, really. Right, yeah. Like, it's not particularly bad. It's not... Uh, really poorly written um i mean i there's there's not really uh usually what i end up doing when we when we when i'm on the show is is taking whatever concept that they put in front of you that they failed to squeeze the life out of and punching it up in a way that makes it more interesting you know because there's some elements that they don't take advantage of yep this one is just sort of like you know aside <laughs> Aside from Troy's mom going on like a crazy hormonal uh, gangbang spree, yeah, well, I don't really know what you could really do to push the story any I, further. This episode just sort of lay there like a dead fish, you know, to continue the sexual <laughs> metaphor. It's just like I'm or, just or to continue the metaphor of the beginning of the episode. Yes, exactly. Which yep. I, I would like to say the one thing I think that first scene is probably the best scene. Um, I don't know if it's a best <laughs> quality wise, but it is definitely the funniest. Are you talking about the, when the the fish beam over, or what? What's the first scene? Yeah, yeah, when the fish beam over. Okay. Uh, because you have these 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 costumes that looked like they were taken from like a Genesis concert. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I, Worf has a good line about saying, "Oh, I've never I've never seen such a handsome race or something, yeah, something like that." That, that was a bizarre, yeah. bizarre thing to say. 
Yeah. Andy. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Sean. Go ahead. Yeah. No, I, I, yeah, I thought this was funny as a series of vignettes. Like I was entertained by the jokes. I mean, a lot of the episodes are funny, but they're not supposed to be funny. This one was clearly written to be tongue in cheek. Right. Yes. I mean, there was very, very weak through line for it, but I like each vignette as it was and I laughed out loud a lot. Um, but, uh, I'm, I'm glad you admitted that because, <laughs> Um, I thought it was so genuinely funny sometimes. Like my idea for the peak scene is um, when Picard calls Data into his date with Loxana. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's yeah. actually pretty fun. It's like, like a legitimately funny scene. Um, well, I sorry, right. I, I didn't mean I, I didn't want to interrupt you, but I just wanted to, set, to finish my my thing I was saying before. My favorite, I think, the funniest thing in the scene was probably not written to be this way, but after they beam the fish guys over. And they, they mention that they're in stasis and whatever. And uh, Picard says something to the effect of, uh, do you have a place you can store them until they wake up? And O'Brien's like, yeah, sure. <laughs> then the next time they cut back, they've just moved them to the side of the room. <laughs> in, in, in the opening scene, O'Brien says, I'll get them out of the way. And he literally just gets yeah, them just, out of the way. <laughs> he just pushes them like two feet to the side. But it's it's that's kind like, of... Sorry, go ahead, John. When, when Luxana sees them at the end, she's constantly freaked out by these things and she goes i like them better with sauce or something yes yeah. they yes look like sea- she says they look like seafood i it's so blatantly racist and a race that doesn't even <laughs> exist obviously but well in this one it continued wesley's through line of being the kid who's in the supermarket line who's like mommy why is that woman so fat you know he he's constantly bringing up he's like "Ooh, these aliens are kind of ugly and he's like you're pretty handsome for a klingon or whatever weird comments he had to wharf about that yeah um the yeah. what what like what I was saying earlier about this is sort of Tracy Torme giving a middle finger to things in a way that like the, the opening scene that you were just talking about Clay it internally makes no sense because they beam over and Picard goes hello welcome to the Enterprise I'm Captain Picard they all stare at them for five minutes and then Picard goes they're in a coma and they can't do anything it's like so <laughs> so why did you say hello to them in the first place. Yeah, he he knows what's going on, and it's just this weird. None of this internally makes sense. Yeah. He's just, I think, Torme is trying to make fun of the the uh, Star Trek universe, and it comes across. This has been the problem with Tracy Torme scripts. I think he's trying to be funny because he was an ex SNL writer, and his scripts emphasis, are emphasis on on X. X. Yes, he his scripts are <laughs> trying most blatantly to be funny. They have like the most broad comedy out of any of the episodes. Yeah, definitely. Um, the problem is that in in trying to make things funny, the characters come across like they have no idea how their universe works. Mm. Uh, and that's most blatant in the holodeck here, where Picard has his favorite series are these Dixon Hill novels, right? Yeah. He goes on the holodeck mm-hmm. and appears to know nothing about how the holodeck works or <laughs> what Dixon Hill is about because he's blown away by everything that happens to him. Like, he doesn't know what a cigarette is. He's like, what, what is this alcohol you're giving me? These are my associates. This is uh, Nails from Chicago, and this is uh, Carlos from South America. This is Madeline, my secretary, and I want you to meet Rex. You know, I don't think I ever heard your last name. Hmm. Don't think I have one. Just Rex, that's all. So, fellas, tell me your troubles. Well, troubles. We've got some, Captain. It seems that a certain woman, both wealthy and beautiful now, thinks that she's going to marry me. She's got looks and bucks? Sounds like you got yourself one heck of a deal. Um, yeah, after yeah. after there was an entire episode that focused on exactly that. Right, and he's still he's still confounded by the entire thing. It's yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't mind Boxana not knowing the technology. Like when she beams in, she thinks her legs are missing. She doesn't call it a turbo lift; she calls it a turbo tube. <laughs> uh, she's like banging on computers to get them to respond, and. She, she needs like r- runway lights to direct her to the holodeck, which she's never heard of. Like, I think that's funny and fine. Like, I, l- I was looking yeah. at a lot of the c- criticism of this. So people seemed to be annoyed that she could exist in this future and not know any of these objects. But I thought it was kind of forgivable and kind of funny. I think yeah, she's I, fumbling around. I, 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 I card fumbling oh, sorry, around. Sean. Yeah, because Picard, no, it. Picard's oh, I was different. Say, yeah, I, I think you're right. I think I don't think it has anything to do with her. I, mean, I, I actually. Uh, you know, my, my dislike for her character, I, I, is only based on that first episode, Haven, that she's in. Um, and I, yeah. that episode as a whole is kind of hot garbage. 
But uh, she, yeah. I think she's fine in this. I think she's, you know, she's good. The stuff that she does with, with Picard is good. And I, I like the, uh, I don't, I don't have that criticism that, you know, her misunderstanding of technology is out of place. Cause I mean, not everybody has been on a fucking starship. You know? Right. Yeah. Right. The, yeah. I, I guess the, well, what do you guys, sorry. No, no, go ahead. I, I, I was asking, like, what, what do you guys, how do you feel? Why do people not like Luxana so much? I can't answer that because I don't really know her that well. Um, like I, like I just said, I, I, I don't, I haven't really found anything about her character specifically that right. comes off bad, but I don't know what the overriding opinion is. I, th- I think the problem, my problem with her would be that she is, she's a sitcom character inserted into the show. Yeah, um, yeah I, can see that. I agree with. She, I mean, she's really just the mother, the yeah. bad mother-in-law cliche. Yeah. Um, sort of come to life and yeah, actually, actually, oh my god, this just occurred to me. You know who she is? She's the. Uh, you, you nailed it. She's the mother-in-law from Bewitched. As the, the, uh, the... Uh, uh, Samantha's mother, who is like the overbearing yeah. witch yeah. character. Yes. It's the same character. Yeah. The... <laughs> you're right. Is it the same actor yeah, or right. just the same character? You mean it's it's the, it's not the same actress. But oh, it's, okay. just, it's the exact same setup of a character. Yes, I right. mean she, she just yeah. she comes in, and no one's willing to put her in her place, sort of. So I, mm. I think that's kind of an annoying thing about her, and it's just I, I feel like her plots just aren't that interesting. Um, right. I mean, so far we've just had. She wants to get, she wants to get married and, or she wants to have some kind of sexual relationship in both of the episodes in Haven. She wants to set up Deanna with, uh, her like betrothed or whatever. And in this one, she's hit menopause and just wants to bone her way across the ship. (laughs) Yeah. I don't, I guess my, my best, my favorite sort of episodes of her are later on. So I might be sort of thinking of of those when I think of her. Yes. Um, but I mean, a lot of the cast, are not really, I don't think are really great at acting. And I think she's actually pretty good and she sells it and she's tongue in cheek. And I think people, you know, like you said, she's a sitcom character in a way. She's kind of in the wrong show and the viewers of Star Trek are probably not going to want to see a bewitched character walking around the ship. Yes. Yes. Um, but, but I mean, my impression was maybe sometimes people are taking Star Trek too seriously when you have a character that's more tongue in cheek. Like I, I wish that they would be able to laugh at it more. Right. A turbo lift is, is kind of a weird term for a thing. And, uh, <laughs> I don't know. What a handsome race. Thanks. Oh, I was just gonna say, yeah. There, there are so many. Uh, I would like to see how how people respond to the space Irish versus Lexana Troy. Right. Like, is is there the same? Is it the same <laughs> kind of the same reason for the uh, disdain? Uh, or you know, I don't want to automatically assume there's like a, a sexist angle to it but uh it's possible um it probably is I, I i feel that way with pulaski a little bit and i wanted to say that this is pulaski's certainly gotten better as the season goes along here yeah they dial her down quite a bit and um, well in this one she had the, that interesting uh, conversation with deanna where Deanna's is like she's becoming fully sexually aware or yeah. whatever and Pulaski has some weird like Picard's got to work on his agility <laughs> remarks yeah uh, yeah it was, it's just kind of it's like... not particularly a crusher thing to say which is interesting mm. um it's different yeah I like when Troy is telling Pulaski in the hallway and she's trying to she goes uh oh my my mother is in heat and she's she's she says blatantly what's happening and she goes if you catch my drip i thought yeah well, you didn't even sugarcoat it you literally said exactly what she's doing they, <laughs> she's in heat and pulaski's like we've all been there baby well, it, right it, it, the, the weird thing is like this alien culture that you know this this menopause is a big thing she's like we betazoids call it the phase and then Pulaski's like, do you mean menopause? And it's funny that, you know, there's this culture that's dedicated to something, but they come up with the stupidest name for what it actually is, where the human version, you know, calling it menopause is actually, like, more interesting sounding than anything. Yeah. Just, right. just yeah. <laughs> It's like, like, we, like, we wanted to call it the phase, but the humans realized that's kind of insulting, so we changed it to something more science-y. It's, it's, yeah. It almost seems like in the attempt to downplay coming up with some weird name for it, they just totally whiffed. Right, and yes. It, it's even worse that they didn't come up with anything for it. <laughs> yeah. They were going to call it like the, uh, the the bitchy slutty period, but that was too on the nose. Or maybe maybe in the script in the first draft it said, we call this 
uh, parentheses, phase, question mark, change later. Yes. And just never changed it. We'll update later. <laughs> I, I mean, I... I I think Bowman is getting close to doing uh, being done here, but I like the way this episode was directed. Sort of, um, I like the way. Honestly, what saved this one for me is I think Patrick Stewart kills his comedy bits that he has to do here. Yeah, uh, he's really good. He has he's, two he scenes. Well. He has the yeah. date with Loxana, and then afterwards in his ready room with uh, Riker and Deanna is a fantastic scene because. Stewart is playing it like it's a horror movie. He has this legitimately <laughs> horrified look on his face as Riker is beaming. Um, and Deanna is just doing her sort of flat explanation of what's going on. Oh, man. Riker in this episode doesn't do a lot, but there, there are two scenes that are just like that scene where he, when, when Deanna Troy, yeah. when Deanna Troy mentions, like, uh, uh, mentions the phase and Riker's like, yeah, you know, they become, <laughs> Twice as horny as usual, and she's like more like four times. He's like, "What? <laughs> you never told me that." <laughs> His eyes light up, and he turns to her, and he's like, "Well, maybe call me back when you're 50. <laughs> yeah, he had no reason to be in that scene other than to look back and forth and grin. And yes, yeah. and grin. Why, why is he there? Said, like it's it's eight. It's eight. To, yeah, there's no reason why he's there. She says it's eight times more powerful, and he just will not take his eyes off of her <laughs> and even blink. Even my wife's watching with. Me, she goes. Riker strikes me as somebody who's gonna who you would see on to catch a criminal, <laughs> to catch a predator. catch a predator. What's that? Catch a predator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To yeah. catch a space predator. <laughs> <laughs> and the other the other bit with him that I love that's just I think I think I still am a hundred percent in the belief that uh, Jonathan Frakes is doing everything with his tongue firmly firmly planted in his cheek. Yes, I think he is too. Especially you can see it in the blocking that he does. And this one, I can't remember exactly what he says, but it's the first, I think it's the first scene after the credits on the bridge. And Wesley says something sort of like questioning, I think it's some sort of vaguely, I don't know anything about women or sex kind of comment. Yeah. And Riker yeah. answers him and he's like right behind him with his crotch <laughs> right on top of his head. <laughs> Like, arms on his yeah. hips, crotch pointed out right at the back of Wesley's head. Yeah, that, that was the scene where uh, Picard comes in and sort of, like, lambasts them a little bit or gently tells them, to like, just because they shouldn't talk about an ambassador like that or whatever. And, uh, yeah, it's a weird yeah. scene. He's he's Riker's basically mounting Wesley's chair yeah. from behind. He's, he's, basically, <laughs> he's, basically saying, he's basically saying, Wesley, do you like movies about gladiators? <laughs> and I'm starting you know, to... This, uh, Oh, sorry. sorry. Go, go. Uh, you notice that uh, look, Luxana's assistant uh, is his name Hung, Mister Naham, I think H O M M E. Naham. Yeah. He's caught. He's drinking the entire episode. Oh he yeah. He puts back like chugs five different kinds of alcohol. And he's while he's he's sort of in the, in the clothes. background of scenes. He's drinking. It's like yeah. when you just pay attention. He's like picking up the <laughs> leftovers from the dinner and drinking the the glasses. <laughs> And it, I mean, I th that's what I would do if I was hanging around with that woman. I know that's what I was thinking. If if she was like your master, he it's sort of a funny little joke that he can only get through it by just being shit faced all the time. <laughs> well, I, it has right. that weird where he drinks like two gallons of that blue stuff in front of Picard, and the scene is like three minutes long, just watching him drink. Well, or maybe it's maybe it's less that he maybe it's less that he's drinking to get through it, and more that just you know hanging out with Lexan is a constant party. Yes, basically, I. That, that that was going to be my other opening joke for uh, the episode, just being like, I'm I'm sorry if I feel a little down, but I was hanging out with Mr. Hom last night, and you know how that guy parties. He's. I thought his name was Mr. Hung the whole time, and I thought, man, if she's really horny, why not just go for Mr. <laughs> Hung? Mr. Hung. <laughs> He's sitting right there. He doesn't talk. It's perfect. It's exactly what she wants. Maybe she'll... Oh, you know what I... No, it's, it's funny you say yeah. that. Um, I noticed, uh, and I'm saying this for Tana, who's probably going to be listening to this. <laughs> I think Lasana Troy is a bit sexist towards men i think a lot of her lines if you had a male character saying it about women you'd be in deep shit oh absolutely like she's think, yeah she treats men obviously men are objects she's like oh well it's hard to find a man to challenge me usually i know what men are thinking and yeah oh i like men that are, that are quiet and you're too rough she had all these kind of one eye liners that uh if you put it in reverse if you had a man saying about a lady then it would get you into right trouble. like her, her line to wharf she's like you're just primal and thinking violent thoughts and it's like yeah. Okay. Like yeah. flip that around. She's sort of the um 
she's kind of a version of the outrageous Okana in a way. Uh, she's like an interesting sort of gender flip on that idea. Yeah. Uh, um, where she's, which then in itself is sexist because it's an older woman who no one wants to have sex with. Right. She's, yeah. She's too aggressive. And every, everyone wanted to bone Okana, even <laughs> yeah. the men on board, but this is the complete opposite. And, uh, you know, Picard is willing to sort of waste his time doing nothing. But I, I, I think I, I liked your point, Sean, about this, um, the episode felt like a bunch of vignettes that didn't really amount to anything by yeah. the end of it. Uh, the biggest yeah. vignette is just Picard completely changing uh, <laughs> tack and going into the holodeck for the second half of the episode. Yeah, that was so weird. <laughs> Where he re- he doesn't <laughs> accomplish People anything. People tried to shoot him three different times and he's just kept hitting pause. <laughs> Yeah, that, that, uh, it, it didn't occur to me in exactly the way you said it earlier, Wes, but, but I, I was thinking the same thing where he gets there and he doesn't have any idea what's going on. Like it, in his favorite program. Yeah. He doesn't know why people, he's like, well, this people keep, keep showing up with guns. <laughs> I, it's, yeah. I picked this 1940s crime, uh, crime thriller. Crime yeah. noir. <laughs> I don't know why people keep trying to yeah. kill me. What can I do for you, Mr. Bender? It's about Alva. You'll have to be a little more precise. Okay, you want to play stupid. That's Jake with me. A week ago, a man came in here. He wanted you to find his girlfriend. Name's Alva. Did I find her? You know, you're getting on my nerves. You found her all right, face down in the river. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, yeah, we're all broken up about it. Especially the boyfriend who's been indicted for murder. And what are you here to do? Ask for a refund? Nah. I'm here to kill you. Computer, freeze program! After after the first attack, he's like, oh, computer, let's mellow it out a bit and let's, you know, let's redo this. And then this even more scary dark shadowy figure (laughs) is just walking in. Puts him in a chokehold. He he immediately should have said, like, pause, like, clearly this is not going in the right direction. I I, I I like that scene. I did really like the third bit where the guy just kicks open the door with the machine gun. That was pretty good. And bad. Picard flies against the wall and it's just like, computer! You may continue. Thank you. You're true ducking me, Hill! Computer, freeze program! I, I enjoyed that scene. And in between each thing, he's sort of resetting his tie and everything and like, we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll start it again. Uh, yeah. he, he does a little bit of a prat fall when the second guy, the computer disappears it and he like falls onto his desk because right. the guy's been holding yeah. him up. Yeah. Um, it is a little out of character for him to just start hitting on his secretary. I gotta say, I I noticed that too. He pushed. It's well, I, okay. So I think that in there you have a, a uh, 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 not being consistent with what you're doing with him because it makes sense if what he's doing is playing the character to the to the theme of that character. Yeah, because he, I mean, you know, that's what those characters do in those stories. Yep. But if you're putting him in there and he, you know. Clearly, clearly the only thing he, if you hadn't seen that first episode where he goes in and does all that stuff, you'd think, oh, he just goes in here and likes to sit behind the desk quietly and has no idea what these books are actually about. Yes. He never made it, he never made it past the 10th page. And, and that was a weird mm-hmm. thing because when he shows up to go in there, he, he sits behind the desk and puts his feet up like he just wants to get away from Troy and he's just going to sit in this office for a little while. Yeah. Uh, and he seems yeah. annoyed when, you know, the book, the computer's like, well, the book does this. So these people are going to have to come in. Well, what actually, it actually made me think about, uh, uh, about Sean, your, uh, your Star Trek naps. Where you would just oh. let, let the uh, the DVD screen play, right? Check and, that. Yeah. yeah, and it made me think of that because, like, wow, that that's awesome. Like, if you could set, go into the holodeck and pick your favorite world, <laughs> and just kind of like leave it on the menu screen, so nothing's Wouldn't actually happening. Great? If if she found him in uh, where Tr- uh, Jordy works, and he's just sleeping underneath the computer console, <laughs> on the carpet, <laughs> don't tell her I'm underneath the desk. <laughs> No, yeah, just that that idea that of big blue like strobe light engine yeah. thing. <laughs> the, just the just that idea of like putting in the program but never picking anything, just leaving it on the menu screen. Yes, so yeah. you have the world yeah. there and just kind of get the sounds and everything. 
That that's kind of cool. Yeah. I like that. Look out the window. We need to just like instead of sounds of the rainforest, sounds of 1930s San Francisco street or whatever was outside the window. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> lots of lots of high pitched, lots of uh, nasally news breaks coming over the radio about Poland being invaded. <laughs> yeah, lots of, lots of references to World War Two. Um, I lots mean, of, lots of. Uh, oh yeah. And what what uh, is Picard? I like how he schools these imaginary people on the future of how America <laughs> is going to be in this amazing country. <laughs> that that's the problem with it. It's like, does Picard not understand that these aren't real people? Why is he telling the yeah. computer about World War Two? Like, get into get in the goddamn character. The the one yeah. that I really did like was the um, it's sort of meta where Picard's like, oh Rex, I'm sorry, I don't need your last name. And the guy's like, I don't think I have one. And then, you know, and it's just like because. Yeah. In the book, that yeah. character wouldn't have a last name. Um, so obviously right. the, the computer can't do it for him, but it was just kind of like a clever little tongue in cheek sort of nod to that, I guess. Yeah. He, he had, he had a good line, uh, something to the effect of, I appreciate that you're on the cuff, but you're halfway up my, uh, halfway up my arm <laughs> up to my collar or something like that, <laughs> which is a, is a, is a really fun bit of like forties, uh, gumshoe slang. Yes. Yeah. Gumshoe slang. I like that. It's Trey a- Martin, Glenn McCormick, 2015. <laughs> <laughs> Trek nap <laughs> trademark like Sean Murphy the, every day. The, Did you guys notice that that bar that bar it looks like the same exact bar from Who Framed Roger Rabbit? Yes, it it sort of does. It's also uh, it's probably the same set that was used in one one zero zero one zero zero one, which the jazz club. Uh, I think it's sort of the same thing. Yeah. That oh makes, yeah. Reusing. Yeah, but it looks like some cheap Paramount lot. Yep. Set that they just have on. Yeah, they throw throw a bunch of dust on it. Another another little tiny thing that I really appreciated. Uh, I think it's also in maybe that first scene on the bridge after the credits. Uh, someone tells a joke or something and everybody laughs and Data laughs too, but he laughs like a robot. He kind of just goes, ha 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 ha. I I kind of got a, uh, something was unhinged with Data in this episode. Um, when yeah. when Picard invites him over, Data has this like it cuts to Data sitting at the bridge science station, and he has this weird look in his eyes as he's like, "Yes, Captain, yeah, I'll uh-huh. be I'll be right there." <laughs> and then he was extremely excited to it's explain like pointing in different directions. Yeah, <laughs> he was extremely excited to explain the brown star thing or whatever Picard was wanting him to do. He's like, "That is a fantastic story. I will tell that." <laughs> I like when Picard's like, if your duties permit, maybe you could come by and blah, blah, blah. I, what if Data had said, actually, I'm really busy? <laughs> Picard would be like, you know what? Drop what you're doing, Data, and be here immediately. A Romulan Warbird just uh, decloaked off the starboard bow, Captain. I have to stay on the bridge. <laughs> yeah. He's like, no, 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 no. Bring uh, bring Mr. Hom <laughs> another bottle of liquor. <laughs> Did you, you notice that when Mr. Hom was referring to Jordy, he put his fingers over his eyes? So yes. <laughs> Vaguely <laughs> offensive. Pfizer. That's and really offensive to handicapped people. It's like doing a wheelchair motion to refer to, I don't know, some character in a wheelchair, to Professor X. Well, what's even more <laughs> offensive, though, is the fact that they're like, yeah, let's go see him, and then he's not in the episode at all. Yeah, he's he's the missing cast member from this it's one. Like, clearly clearly, she walked in the door, got one look at Jordy, and was like, ugh, no thank you. <laughs> no thank you. Yeah, his, new, his name should be Mr. Hung. <laughs> <laughs> Oh boy, <laughs> he's he's no no Wesley. Aww. Wesley Wesley will grow up to uh you know one day he'll be a big strong man. I I was vaguely uncomfortable when when that was going to happen, but oh yeah, she's you know what they should have done. So at, uh, when they get to the the piece at the end where apparently Riker doesn't like to play along and he doesn't want to get into a cool suit when he goes to the forties. Um, oh well, explain to me why Data got dressed up. I think Data just really likes the holodeck. <laughs> Because, I mean, he and Jordy do that Sherlock Holmes thing that they get in full costume for. I think he just enjoys it. Well, I mean, which his, is, his... Which is really interesting on, like, a... Like, to... That, data as a I, person that's, yeah, level? Yeah, that's kind of breaking my mind a little bit. <laughs> Think about Data as a robot really enjoying play acting as a human inside a... Fi- uh, now I've gone cross-eyed. <laughs> well, he's... um. imagine... Data's robot. He doesn't enjoy anything except for oil or whatever. Yeah, he enjoys this nutrient. <laughs> I think that that character he he's playing the same character he played in the Big Goodbye, the uh, the South American Carlos guy. Oh, nice. So yeah. he gets a chance to yeah. re- revisit that character. I don't know where. I mean, I, I sort of get the pun that Riker would be called Nails, but I don't understand why uh, it really <laughs> would happen. Um, I don't know. I don't know why Data gets dressed up. He doesn't even have a line when he gets yeah. into the bar. Um, I have a 
I have a theory about why when he when he walks in, his shadow is cast against the outside of the door. Oh. So the, you know, the bartender's like, uh oh, and they think it's gonna be you know Knuckles McGee or whatever. Yes. <laughs> the, the the collector. And then you walk in and stay there. Like, I would imagine that they might have shot more of a scene with some more dialogue, but they might have cut it out so that ended up not amounting to Yeah, maybe. I, I, cause I could, I could see comedy in that, but it's, I think that might, this episode might have the most tenuous link. Uh, you know, some episodes don't have a link between A and a B. This one sneaks in a slight manhunt Dixon Hill thing where they're searching for a guy and it's this weird, like pseudo intentional link that you're like, oh, both of these are about f- trying to find somebody, and it's like, what what yeah, a pointless. I, I, that. Well, I would. That's tough though, because I wouldn't even call the Dixon Hill thing like a B story, because it, it it sort of like, becomes the A story in a way. Well, it's not even really a story though, because he's just kind of hanging out there. He's yes. not doing anything. Yep. Yep. Um, and it's like I was I was kind of looking for that in this episode because like the, the 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 A and the B story are really. The A story is Loxana Troy and Heat, and the B story is waiting for these fish guys to wake up. Yes, yeah. And which, <laughs> you know, ties together oh so neatly <laughs> with uh, Loxana <laughs> Troy being like, oh, they're, they're assassins. Get them um, out of here. Get them out of here. Control S. I'm done writing for the day. The, the fish thing is fascinating because along with the thing like we were laughing about, O'Brien just sort of moves them off to the side. Um, yeah. The whole mission is to pick these guys up, right? right. And P- Picard goes, uh, Doctor, do you have space for them? She goes, no, uh, I'll put something <laughs> together. Why Why don't they have space for them? It's The whole point of the mission is to pick them up and transport them around. Well, they did have space. They had a nice, cozy corner off <laughs> the side. But then she... Do you think he pushed them, physically put, shoved them, or do you think he beamed them three feet over to the left? I, I think he flipped them <laughs> like tires. Like, he sort of rolled them <laughs> over themselves, and they just ended up there. But um, what was weird was... Like a caber toss. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> and they, they just stuck there. The um, it's sort of a weird difference, but I, I liked how the preparation for them in sick bays, they just lay on the bed. I don't know what else she had to do, but she puts them on the bed. Uh, the effect where his eye blinks was actually pretty good. Did was you... that CGI? I think it was. And yeah, it, I couldn't tell. It was like seamless. I, I was shocked by how sort of good it looked. Um, yeah. Well, the camera wasn't moving at all. I, that could have been not something as complex as CGI. That could have been something very simple. But if you just keep the camera steady, it, yeah, it might have just it might have been a freeze a freeze shot, and you just have this like, yeah, yeah, that, quick optical. Or something, I mean, that, that it's yeah. just. In terms of, like, if you're trying to produce this show, what a waste of money these alien outfits were. <laughs> they don't they don't even do anything. Um, I don't oh, really know if you the, could... the, whole, the, the thing that gets me about this episode is, like, these shows cost a lot of money to make. Over a million dollars in 1989. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean it, but that's ex- super expensive. Wait, how much? Th- yeah. These were over a million dollars each in 1989. Fuck you. But, but imagine you're you're a stage crew guy and you're like, hey, why are we building this bar? Well, the cards can be here doing nothing. Hey, why are we putting data in this suit? Eh, no reason. <laughs> why is Riker's leg up near near west? I don't know. Like, why are these fish here? Like, eh, maybe they'll be terrorists. Like, there's so many pointless, expensive things that happen. And I cannot believe someone spent this much money even, on a script that just didn't go anywhere. Even the... Uh... You know, to confound the pointlessness, the pointlessness of them bringing food along, which <laughs> amounts to absolutely nothing. Uh, Wesley is yeah. sort of a nosy little bitch and is like digging around <laughs> in it when they beam over, which seems like it's an invasion of privacy. Um, and then when they feed it to them, why does Worf just stick his <laughs> hands into it and then like pulls up a big pile and then just carries that off? I didn't, I didn't understand any of that. I, I guess just. Showing him it was there or something, so you can see how they're how they act like animals. How they're disgusting know. when they eat with their wet, yeah. smacking noises that made me want to vomit. <laughs> it was disgusting. Why do you think? Uh, what did you think about Wes admitting that Worf is kind of handsome for a Klingon? Uh, I think some of Wesley's strongest scenes are when he's with Worf. He hasn't had many, but they're kind of a good pairing at this point in the show. Um, yeah, it's a weird weirdly sexual tension when he's wearing his little camel toe outfit this episode <laughs> um so it's a little bit awkward but outside of that it's it's not too bad i guess yeah they, you're right they do have a connection i'm thinking about later episodes too where there's a weird they, they 
doesn't really go far, but it's nice knowing like the most aggressive character embraces the wimpiest character. Right. I, I do find that a little bit weird. Yeah. yeah and, and it works. It works too because, uh, you know, on, on, as far as the crew of the ship goes, he is the most, uh, I don't know if there's like a, 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 a an elegant way to say this, but he's the, he's the most, uh, uh, exotic, really. Yes. Um, yes. Yep. And so having Wait, Wesley or uh, Worf. Uh, Worf. Worf and Data oh. would be the two most, yeah. And Worf, yeah, yeah, but 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 Worf is is more so because he's an actual person. So having Worf, who is having Wesley, who is younger and you know has never seen a Klingon before, kind of thing, or you know who is a little bit uh, more uncouth about that kind of stuff, interact with him, I think works really well. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. Right. He's. He, I just. I, I, it's continuing the first, like, I don't understand why Wesley's there in the first place. Picard gives a throwaway line. He's like, I thought you might want to see this, which I don't really understand why he'd be involving Wesley in the first place. But it's, yeah, and he's just <laughs> standing there. And what are Worf and him just doing, just standing there staring at these things as people are coming in and out of the transporter room? It's all very know. it's all very poorly thought out. They should roll, yeah. the, roll their asses to sick by. So here's a question. <clears throat> Do you think this story would have been better? So this seems, it seems like it should be a bottle episode, but it's not because they've, they go into the holodeck and they've got this other, this expensive set and all this kind of stuff. You're right. Do you yeah. think, do you think it would have been a better story if it had been more of a bottle episode where it was, you know, let's say for that it was just Picard trying you know stuck in a room with Luxana or some something where it was like more of them playing off of each other yes yeah like a tom and jerry episode with Luxana <laughs> and card no i'm serious i think that you could have just made it about her pursuing the card and make it go even further with the comedy and make it even more awkward right funny yes you know? yes i mean the whole through line of the episode is like oh Luxana is annoying and weird but she did stop these two terrorists so <laughs> that's why we put up with her <laughs> I just, the casualness with which they deal, she's like, these guys are assassins. Everyone's just standing there. No one even moves. They just go, Can you, well, get them out of here then. And then they, she beams off and it's like, they averted what seemed to be a catastrophic event and they do it in this most low-key way possible. Um, Mick yeah, Fleetwood also, gets a line or something. Also, that comes that comes at the end of an episode where, unless Picard was lying, like, th there's, a, there's a through line of Luxana's like telepathy not being accurate. Well, they were there? asleep. They were asleep for most of it. So she. Well, no, 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 not not that. It's like, well, uh, there are a few points earlier in the episode where she says something, and I, I think it's specifically Picard is like, "That's not what I was thinking." And uh, Clay, I, I'm glad you brought this point up. I watched this twice recently. The first time I watched it, and I um, I felt when I got to the end, I was like, "Oh, I think Deanna had a scene." Where she says that her mother is not operating at 100%. I was like, oh, maybe it's a side effect of the phase. They sort of lose their telepathy or something. Yeah. And yeah. that's yeah. not the case. <laughs> so that would have been an interesting way, I think, to go to handle it. But I don't understand why Deanna never calls out her mother for lying. Because she can tell that Picard does. Does Picard really have feelings for her? Well, that's the thing. I uh, So it kind of plays into this ending. Because either... Either her powers are not at 100% and she is lying about, <clears throat> or at least mistaken, about how Picard feels about her. Yep. Or she's not and he's just covering in front of everybody else because of, you know, that when, as she's beaming out, she's like, oh, Captain, you're such a dirty dog. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, but why does, why does Deanna never save the captain's face by going, everyone, my mother's lying. Like, this is not actually what's going on. Everybody calm down. My mother <laughs> is just a giant whore. <laughs> just, a, just a huge <laughs> problem here. But I, um, you know, the other sort of aspect I, I oh. oh, go ahead, John. I was going to say, I, I, I think maybe Troy, uh, Luxana is just messing with the card. Like she knows that he doesn't, oh, yeah. but yes. she's just fucking with him. I, I, th yeah, I, I think, think if that awesome. ended up, if they made that true, it would validate her character a lot more that she has a sense of humor about herself even. Yeah, yes. yeah I agree. But I, I think they don't write the character to have a sense of humor about herself. Um, but it, it's sort, no. of, it sort of comes, a, I guess the sort of, with this rewatch, my main problem with Loxana is I feel like you could have something really cool with the Betazoids. Mm. And instead, they aren't played very well. Like, in Haven, her introduction, she's presented as... She's a little bit more pompous than she is here. 
But the pomposity is interesting because she comes from a race that they all know what everyone else is thinking, right? So for their mm-hmm. development, it would make no sense for them not to sort of just tell people, like call out people, you know, like you're thinking about having sex with me. You're thinking about this because right. there would be no lying in Betazoid culture because there's no point to it. Um, right. They don't really play that up. And instead, they just use it where Deanna and her mother can talk to each other without opening their mouths. And that's like the extent of their relationship with each other. Um, <laughs> I just feel like it's a little bit of a letdown because it's kind of a cool concept that they don't really explore. Yeah. There, there's a, a novel, uh, I've read some of the books, and there's one, it's like a parallel universe where Troy is evil, or the whole crew is evil, yep. and Troy ends up taking over everything, and ter- she's basically Darth Vader, because oh, she knows what everyone's thinking, people are terrified to be around her, like they clear their heads before they go get anywhere near her, Yep. and uh, it's, it's it's really intense, and that's kind of... I think what you're saying, and it was a really great idea. It was amazing. Yeah, that's a, that's a shame they never did that. That would have been awesome. That yeah. would have been that would have been a much better movie than Star Trek Nemesis. <laughs> <laughs> I actually like Nemesis. Um, I'll, I'll... Oh, by the way, I just want you. I just want to get this on record now. Yeah. That uh, I am okay with sitting through these bad episodes because this validates me calling dibs on Star Trek First Contact when we get there. Sure, sure. The um... in four years. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be in the phase by the time we start talking about uh yeah it's you know i uh, i guess we can wrap this up but my i don't think i didn't i didn't hate this episode um i think i could come up with a lot of arguments about why i would rate it poorly um i think it made me laugh enough like legitimately sort of maybe not laugh out loud but like chuckle or whatever um, some of the scenes are p- played very well. It's really just sort of, and I, I don't even mind the fact that it's sort of like you're saying a bottle. Like I, I, I like the fact that it's just sort of watching the crew go about their day in a weird way. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree. I, I, I like those kind of little things. Like not everything has to be an episode where they're saving a planet or doing something. I oh, just, yeah, I, I just thought it was, it's a little bit, it just doesn't succeed at what it's trying to do. And her playing cat and mouse would have been a better idea. Yeah, I yeah, I, I wonder how I would like to know how a person watching this at the time would respond to it because <clears throat> if you're watching it week to week, it, it's you know when when you're watching them now and you've got a hundred something episodes that you can watch at any time with no hesitation, you kind I feel like you can be a lot more uh, forgiving to the ones that sort of like you know don't cut it. Um, but if this is the only Star Trek you're getting for that week, I wonder how it goes over. Yeah, we we talked about that on Twitter. I guess we can talk about it for a little bit here. But um, Alan Sepinwall wrote, uh, I forget what he was writing about. He was writing about some show, but his basic uh, gist of it was that, you know, in this new modern TV era, uh, it's basically, you basically can't have a show that doesn't start well. Um, yeah. You know, people will give a show a couple episodes and if it's not kicking people will just not continue with it yeah and it's fairly amazing to think that star trek the next generation has had 50 episodes that are objectively not good tv (laughs) and they were still coming um Mm. which is a real difference in media there were just basically there was just no content in 89 you know you, you had to go with these shows that were just not very good and it's astounding that the show managed to stay uh, and become a success eventually because it is it is rough the first two seasons. Yeah, I agree, man. I, I think it has to do with the type of fanship this has. Uh, we were kind of talking online uh, on Twitter about this. I, I said, uh, I, I love the idea of Star Trek. I don't think any series has ever really embellished the idea as much as I would have liked. You know, it's yes. like... That if you read the idea on a piece of paper and get the sense for the characters and what Roddenberry was going for, it's almost like believing in a religion in a way, like hope. It's pushing the hope. And I feel like because you set it off with that mentality, you end up getting a lot of viewers who are going to stick with you during the bad times because they really want to believe that humans are, are not doomed. You know? Mm, yes. Yeah. And it's, I don't think it's the episode themselves that they like. It's just you set the setting where it's like, I wish I was on that ship. I wish I had the holodeck. I wish we were going to different places. That's what survives. It's not necessarily the plot themselves. So I yeah. think people are very forgiving with Trek. 
I, or other types of audiences. I, I know what you mean. I, I, I had a similar experience uh, with The Office because The Office was a great show. But yeah. there was a point. American it, or British are you talking uh, about? Well, both. I mean, but mainly the, the American one. Okay. Because the, the American one went like seven or seven seasons or something. Yes. And there's a point where it starts to get objectively not good. But I kept watching it because I loved the characters so much that I just liked spending time with them. Yeah. Yep, uh, because right. I have no real friends in, in the real world. And so I have to <laughs> interact with people over television and. And, and laugh along with them as they tell funny jokes. They never say anything yeah. mean to you. No, never. <laughs> uh, but but that it's that kind of thing where it's like, you know, people will be like, oh, why are you still watching that show? It's terrible. It's like, yeah, I know it's not great, but I enjoy these characters, so I want to continue watching what they do. Yes. Yeah. Yep. It's a comfortable setting. It, yeah. It's a place you want to be. So if the episodes are bad, it doesn't matter in a way because you still love the ship. You still love the idea of where they're headed and the possibilities. Yes. it's um, It's... It's just a crazy number. It's It's been 50 episodes. Some series that are my favorites didn't get 50 episodes. You know what yeah, I mean? It's right. like, this is a crazy, crazy amount of time. and But it sort of goes against your argument of liking the characters because well, I guess they're becoming sort of likable by now. But they're... Well, what I, I meant more kind of... It, it's with Star Trek, it's with Next Generation, I, I, I know where you're going. Um, and I, I mean it more in that it's it's what Sean was saying. It's about the experience of being there with this concept that you enjoy. Yep. So you can kind of look past whether or not they're, you know, nailing it on all, on all cylinders story-wise. Yeah, right. I'd, I'd be interested in seeing what percentage of viewers in the early seasons were really just big fans of the original series. Yeah. And we're, stick, mm-hmm. we're sticking it out just to... Uh, just because they love the original series so much that they were just like, well, I like Star Trek, so I'll keep watching this. Yeah. Um. It didn't do gangbusters in the ratings. It was it did fine. Um, it's certainly gangbusters by today's standards, but back then it was yeah, not not really that's a huge the deal. Thing too, um, I've been listening to the uh, uh, Kumail Nanjiani's X Files podcast, and one of the things he he keeps pointing out is how, it, at least you know, especially in the early seasons of the X Files, they were not doing great in the ratings, but not doing great in the ratings in 1993 is better than every show on television now. Yep. Yep. And obviously that's because, you know, there's no internet and you know, that kind of thing. So I think there was a lot more leeway as far as uh, 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 that stuff back then, just because everything, people were just watching things. Yes, you, right? you, you, you had to watch something, so they'll watch garbage if it's on right. TV. <laughs> um, right. And now, now we're at a point where there's too much good TV, and I get stressed out somehow because I'm like, God damn it, I have to watch this other good show and get through this. You know, it's like, oh, all these episodes yeah. of Daredevil are now on Netflix. I got to get through those. Jesus Christ. And it's like, um, <laughs> it's just a weird, weird situation to be in. As as opposed to you know v- VHSing episodes of Star Trek on whatever channel it was airing back in 1989. Yeah, yeah if someone came out to us now and said, "I'm thinking about getting into Star Trek because I hear a lot of buzz," I mean, would you really recommend this over you know Daredevil or Sons of Anarchy or no. Breaking Bad or No? It's such a tough sell. I mean, I I look at that person and I go, "What kind of person are you? Are you interested in science? Or are you interested in theories and like these hypotheses of human interaction and all the stuff that?" Star Trek tackles like you need a very specific type of brain to yeah. really get it, and you, you're not looking for uh, a really good batting average. You're looking for somebody with some fucking patience. right. You'd have yeah. to add you'd have to add a caveat to that though. You'd be like, do you like uh, examining important issues in a half-assed way that doesn't always make sense? <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, it's the, how do you feel about how do you feel about unintentional and kind of hilarious sexism and racism? <laughs> it's just that kind of a problem, like. So many of the episodes now, you know, are regarded as classics. I feel this way, I guess, about Measure of the Man, most of, the, most of all. Measure of a Man is an okay episode. It yeah. raises a much more interesting discussion than the episode is capable of having, uh, which is a problem. Right. You know, in, they're limited to 45 minutes. They're limited to basically a G rating on television. Uh, so you can't go too deep, but... You know, I think it's what you're saying, Sean. Like the the idea of the show has never really been captured that well by any of the series. I, I'd yeah. say maybe Deep Space Nine got the closest to anything. 
Um, well, it's it's interesting too, though, because I, I, I was reading something similar ab- about that, and uh, it points out that the concept in its purest form is does not lend itself to interesting television, right? Because it's it's very much you know uh, we we've uh, evolved into this ideal society where everything is great. And we're just kind of checking things out. Yep. And, you know, I mean, that's what we've talked about it before about why the first season of T of TNG has some problems because these writers are trying to write character drama and yep. Rod, Roddenberry doesn't want them to do that because right, he yeah. doesn't want any character tensions or anything because everybody is supposed to be great with each other. Yep. And it's, <laughs> it's really tough to, it's, it, that's almost impossible to do. <laughs> it is. And I was thinking, yeah. uh, Enterprise came out seven years too early because enterprise actually starts to do uh dark things with it's mm-hmm. like legitimately dark like you know it's the founding of the federation or whatever uh the vulcans are sort of holding back humanity because they don't want them to advance so there's this weird tension between the species that you could have really played up mm-hmm. um right and it, you know it, it unfortunately enterprise came out in 2000 when you're like Sort of at the Dawson's Creek era, like the you know the theme song is stupid oh, and it's like the theme nothing. Song is the worst. <laughs> nothing is really nothing's really good about this. But imagine, I think Todd Vanderwerf of uh, Vox dot com did a thing about if if he was to bring back Star Trek, he'd do it as a thirteen episode Netflix series mm. and have it be right. maybe just a single self contained story for that season. Um, yeah. What's interesting is, uh, when I was, when I was watching Battlestar, the new one, the new ones, and that's like 2005 or six. Yep. And Deep Space Nine had, was winding down or was already over. Uh, and it really became apparent how dated Star Trek allowed itself to become. You know, when you see how cutting edge Battlestar was or even Firefly, uh, it's like, man, Star Trek, I, God, you guys really did just go way too slow. Yep. You know, we're capable of watching something way more edgy. But you guys always played it safe, even, and it was kind of disappointing. Even just the way it's shot, it's shot in a very dated television way. You know, it's yeah. sort of, it's sort yeah. of shot with multi camera, but they're not in front of a live studio audience, so everything is very. It's very obvious when they go uh, either handheld camera or single camera shooting. Mm-hmm. Um, right, and it's just well, there's that the uh, in uh, in Q Who it's. One shot where Rob Bowman decided to put the camera down at the floor. Yes, and I think every, I think all three of us were like, "Holy shit! Where did that come from?" <laughs> what is the and uh, right. and, and this, to bring it back to this episode, they have a nice crane shot in the bar when they sit down. Yeah. Uh, yep. It's like it's oh, it's actually it looks pretty good. And the same with um, he does some dramatic stuff with Dixon Hill's enemies when they come in. They're shot in shadow and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, that that stuff. As soon as they started that stuff, I was thinking, man, I, why does the whole show look like this? Yes. This is, he actually seems to be, this is the stuff he's interested in. Yes. And I think, yeah. I, I would assume it's a byproduct of the production schedule having too many episodes. You can't afford to be too artistic with your direction. You just have to yeah. shoot it and get it done. Right. Um, to, right. Just a tiny thing, Sean, though, around this point, there was a, uh, a young man who was somehow got his girlfriend to uh, allow him to get him a tour of the Star Trek sets. And he did something that is generally frowned upon, and he brought a script, and he gave it to Gene Roddenberry's assistant, who passed it along to a boss. And he was eventually hired to write that script, and it was Ron D. Moore, who eventually would go on to Battlestar, and oh, is yeah. actually one of the more famous writers who would finish up Star Trek for this, uh, season yeah. three onward. Oh, wow. He had a big beef with... He had a big beef with... Uh, well, there's an interesting connection between Voyager... Him like wanting out of that because he was promised Voyager would be more like Battlestar. It would be aggressive. The ship would be falling apart. Yep. It would be hell. And it ended up being more of a comedy type Star Trek. Yes. So he was so mad that he was mad at, um, who's the guy that's like Braga. the protector of Star Trek? Brandon. Chakotay. Yeah. Well, there's Berman and Braga. Can Brandon Braga. Yeah. Chakotay. Yes. That's- <laughs> yeah. Sure. <I'm- laughs> yeah. Yeah. Shoreman. I. Think was the one who tied the thing around Roddenberry's statue. He had like a blindfold over Roddenberry's bust. Oh, <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> oh, man. I know we're going along here, but so uh, he had a bust of Gene Roddenberry in his office. And um, what's his name? Sherman? Berman. B E R M A N. Sorry, Rick, yep. Rick Berman. Yeah, Rick Berman. So after Roddenberry died, they, the writers started pushing him to get more, 
more aggressive. Like, let's have characters argue now that Rodberry's gone. God rest his soul. Yes. <laughs> let's do some good, good writing here. And uh, he's like, no. And he just kept fighting to protect Roddenberry. And eventually he felt like there was such a compromise that Roddenberry wouldn't like what the show had become. So he tied a ribbon around Roddenberry's eyes on just, his bust. Just to not and see it. it. I guess it remains there to this day. Yeah, really? Berman's Berman's sort of vilified as the man who ruined Star Trek. I don't think it's all his fault. I think they did do too, way too many spinoffs. There were way too many series in a short period of time. Mm. Um, right. But he refused to really update what the show was at yeah. that point. And, you know, yeah. TV's changing in the late 90s. Things are like, not that Star Trek's like Oz, but you're starting to get the HBO <laughs> dramas and stuff like that, you know, like... <laughs> They should have a prison rape scene in Star Trek oh, to really man. bring Oof. things home. But it's... Uh, <laughs> yeah, go yeah, ahead, Clay. It's, you know, I think... I think I think Roddenberry was kind of missing something critical. I understand his idea that he does... He, he has a certain vision for the human race, et cetera, et cetera. But I think you can have both. I don't think it has to be one or the other where it's either everybody is on the same page and lovey dovey or it's all, you know, uh, no lights and shooting yes. people. Right. Because yeah, the yeah. thing is your story at the, at the, at the end of all this is still about people and people are still people. And they're just because they're not all going to act the same way. Right. So I, I, I you can still get the drama that just human beings will supply inside this, core this core concept it's it's not mutually exclusive yeah yep no i i, I agree it's just a yeah it's a, a weird weird dated problem that the show never really covered yeah. from eventually they get better at the storytelling to get around those weaknesses mm -hmm. um but i think yeah. the av club described it best as roddenberry was always a better salesman than he was a creative force um yeah right which i'd agree with yeah yeah no, I was telling Clay on the, on the phone, like, what does Roddenberry truly get credit for? All right, so he pushed a sci-fi show into mainstream like no one else had before. Yep. He really did populate the crew with uh, diverse characters, women, minorities. So he totally gets credit for that. You know, he has the first uh, interracial kiss. Like, yep. he did a lot of stuff right. Um, was he a great husband? Was he a great father? Was he a great writer? Uh, no, all that stuff's debatable. You know? <laughs> and <laughs> he, he, he seemed no? <laughs> he seemed to be a bad he seemed to be a bad coworker as well. Um, you know, there's a lot right. of staff turmoil, and the people who were writing for him generally had sort of unpleasant things to say about the experience. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's a that totally... documentary his son made was amazing. Yes. Yeah, that's that's a really good really good watch. Not to totally. Uh, tear the guy's history and legacy to shreds. Um, but did you guys see that uh, Scientology documentary? Mm-hmm. There's, there seemed to be, uh, from what I know about Roddenberry in his later years, there seemed to be some sort of a slight parallel to the way uh, L. Ron Hubbard was doing things. Because didn't Roddenberry also start doing, like, touring uh, college campuses, talking about, like, the 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 ideas and the futurist ideas of Star Trek and stuff like that. Oh, I find it yeah. I find it interesting that like you said earlier, Sean, it's kind of like a religion, and it's it's it, it kind of is not in the sinister yeah. way that Scientology uh, developed into. Yeah, or supposedly sinister. I you know don't don't <laughs> sue me or anybody. I have no money. Podcast so. is over. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's we had a phase clay out again. Turn his <laughs> microphone down. <laughs> I, I mean, and when you when you look at them, uh, Roddenberry has bears a striking resemblance to Hubbard. They sort of look the same. They're like this sort of jolly old, uh, you know, rudy faced uh, salesman who yeah. you know are, are just going about this thing. It's it's a very odd sort of weird situation. Yeah, now that's a good point. But what do yeah. you what do you guys? Uh, I think we'll wrap up because we're just hitting an hour. So. We will play a clip and then come back with our ratings. We thought since you were going to the same conference, you might like to beam down the other delegates. Oh, they're not delegates. Those two are assassins. That is an outrage. Lies. We demand you transport us at once. Don't bother to deny it. Your minds are so unsophisticated, I can read your thoughts in my sleep. Oh, their robes are lined with ultratium, highly explosive, virtually undetectable by your transporter. She's correct, sir. I am detecting large amounts of ultratium. Well, of course you are. They were planning on blowing up the entire conference. 
There's a wharf. Take them to level five. Disarm them. Hold them for questioning. Aye, sir. Ah, well, I didn't find a mate, but I did save the conference, as well as your reputations. All in a day's work, I suppose. Goodbye, Mrs. Troy. And thank you. Energize, Chief O'Brien. Jean-Luc? Shame on you for thinking such a thing. So what you guys what would you guys give this thing out of a uh, one to five? Oh I'd I'd go with a three. Really? Yeah, I mean wow. you know, I or, or let's say two and a half. I mean I feel like it's right in the middle where I didn't hate it. Yep. And I mean I didn't there's nothing that stood out to me as being objectively bad. Yep. Uh it was kind of inoffensive all around. Um yeah, I mean I enjoyed I enjoyed some of it. Some of it was funny. Uh yeah, I, if there's like a uh, like uh, an idling uh, whatever your idling rating is, that's right. probably what I would give it. Okay. Sean, what do you think? Yeah. Uh, I'd go with two and a half as well. I, it's a bad episode, but it's got a lot of charm for me. I think Lotsana is able to get other characters to react in ways that no other visiting character gets. Uh, you know, I think she gives her daughter a lot to do, and she gets reactions out of a card and all that stuff. I love it. And uh, even though it's not a great episode, I kind of appreciate how it just goes like falls to the wall with, with how gloriously bad it is. It doesn't really make any apologies. It's like you see the cliff and you don't even try to slow down. Right. No, it, it does embrace what it is. I embrace it for what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's funny. I, I thought I was going to be considered generous. I'm, I'm going to give it a two. Um, it's, it's like we all, we've all been saying there's enough here that it's not a horrible, uh, trudge. Like the idea isn't particularly offensive enough to really boot it down to a one. I think it has some narrative problems and it has a couple, you know, sort of weird. It's really just a bunch of vignettes that are held together by the loosest of terms. Yeah, uh, that I, yeah. you know, I, it didn't occur to me as I was watching it. But once you said that, um, it kind of tightened everything up c- for me. Because when I was watching it, I was like, this this is structured really weird. Yeah. Because <laughs> of how they the second half is all just Picard you know, hanging out in the holodeck with nothing to do. Uh, talking to a bartender. Yeah, completely, <laughs> Literally, yeah. It, completely disconnected from everything else that's going on. But if you do think of it as vignettes, it makes a lot more sense. Yeah, yeah. And some of them yeah. are good. It's like a sketch comedy show. You you know, you remember the great ones, and then there's a lot of garbage in, uh, you know, sketch shows. Once you, once you move past remembering all the great sketches and you watch reruns of sketch shows, there's a lot of filler material. Oh, yeah. Just, oh, yeah. Uh, just the nature of the and beast. For me, this, this might be the most laugh-out-loud episode of the entire series. For, you know, I'm curious to count like how many times I actually laughed genuinely, and I bet you this is up there as far as Interesting. Laughing. I know that's not what people watch Star Trek for, but yeah, it yeah. might be an award winner for me just for the funniest episode. The only one, better or worse. only one off the top of my head that might challenge that is Data's Day, which I think is has some legitimately funny moments in it. Uh, and this one doesn't even have Joe Piscopo. No, absolutely not. Don't need him. Don't need him. There's one where uh, War- Warp is in the Old West with his son. That's oh, I hate that episode. <laughs> oh, man. No. A, oh, fist, a fistful of datas. <laughs> is that the name of it? Yes. Yep. <laughs> I would. I would like to also Brent say. Spiner with fake. He's got a mustache. Oh lord. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And like a fake, fake, fake breasts, but they're yeah. clearly plastic. <laughs> Wait, does he like play everybody? The computer sort of multiplies him on the holodeck, so he plays all the characters except for Worf and like oh, Alexander, god. I think. Oh boy. Yeah. I. Uh, I, I <laughs> one last note on this one, though. I would like to say again, if this is a season one episode, this episode's unwatchable. I think if this was season one, it's Haven, because I don't think this is oh, all yeah, that okay. different from Haven. You know yeah, what I mean? Right. Which is which is either interesting and I guess it shows you how much you can improve on a concept if you give it a, get a second shot. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Interesting. Well, thank you guys for coming on. Thank you for talking Star Trek. Yeah, thanks, man. Yeah, anytime. Good to talk. We, uh... I'll be back. We're wrapping up season two pretty quickly. uh, What's after this? Emissary. A very important episode. I don't know if it's very good, but Emissary is after this. So thank you guys again, and we will see you next time.